Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Around the World by Private Jet, Cultures in Transformation. My name is Victoria Hansen and I'm the Programme Director here at the New York Times for Times Journeys. And I'm delighted to have two guests with me today. Firstly, Nick Kristoff, an op-ed columnist here at the New York Times, and Lisa Lesperance, a product manager at Abercrombie & Kent and who's a specialist in private jet travel there. And we're collaborating with Abercrombie & Kent on this very special tour. Now here's a very quick uh, run through of the webinar today. I'm going to, to introduce Nick Kristoff in a second. We're then going to have some questions with him and then Lisa will run through the itinerary. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have time for um, any other questions that you have specifically about the itinerary itself. So first and foremost, why travel with the New York Times? Well, it's very simple really. It's all about insight, context and perspective. So on any of our trips, whether that's a cruise, a small group tour or one of our recently launched trips for high school students, when there's a set departure date, there is an expert that accompanies our group. And they're there to answer your questions and to really bring either an article to life or a subject matter. Um, so we choose destinations that, start, uh, that tell a story for exactly that reason. You could be traveling to Iran and exploring the culture there. You could be going to CERN with Dennis Overby, for example, and understanding everything that went into making the Large Hadron Collider. You could be going to Provence and experiencing uh, Provencal cuisine, even uh, Russia and the political situation. So it really is very diverse and we have six different tour types, if you will. Most recently, Private Jet was launched in October, but we also launched a series of independent short breaks. We're calling 36 Hours Plus, themed around our very popular travel articles. And then Student Journeys, as I mentioned, our new travel program for high school students. But let's get back to today's webinar and uh, the experts that will be joining you on this tour. So we have four experts that will be traveling with the group. Uh, they'll be joining for around a week each. Firstly, you'll be joined by Alan Riding, who's a former foreign correspondent. Um, the story that I remember very well from him is the fact that he was chased out of Medellin by Pablo Escobar. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to share that story with you and many others. Uh, Nicholas Kristoff, as I mentioned, and who we'll be meeting in a second, will join uh, for Easter Island, Samoa and Australia. And then Elaine Chialino, who is our former Paris bureau chief, an expert in Iran. She's accompanied a number of times journeys, land departures so far and, and is delighted to be joining the private jet initiative. And then Elizabeth Bumiller, who is our Washington editor, so hot off the election coverage. Um, and we're very excited for uh, her being able to join with everything that's going on at the moment. Uh, she'll be joining in Morocco and Iceland. We then have four on the ground specialists that you will meet uh, during your time there. Uh, somebody in uh, Cuba, in Bogota, in Sydney, and then also in Marrakesh. And in that instance, it's Carlotta Gull, who's our senior North Africa correspondent based there. So with that, Nicholas Kristoff, um, he really is somebody that I'm just, on a personal level, very much in awe of. He writes about the most important subjects that are going on uh, today, the issues that need to be heard but aren't necessarily ones that are comfortable um, hearing about and learning about. Um, he's written at the Times, or he's worked at the Times since 1984, has been a columnist since 2001, writing about all sorts of different things from human rights, women's rights, um, global foreign affairs, health, um, has won two Pulitzer Prizes, including one with his wife Cheryl Wudun for their coverage of the Tiananmen Square uh, crisis, and uh, has written a number of best-selling books, um, including Half the Sky, that Oprah Winfrey devoted two full programmes to. Uh, some of 
the most recent articles that Nick's written are very diverse from everything from mothers in prison to whether Donald Trump is a Russian poodle um, to actually during the holiday season giving gifts that really matter. So without further ado, I'm delighted to have Nick Christoph here today um, and I'd like to introduce you personally. So thank you so much, Nick. Hi. Well, really nice to join you. And um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the trip. You know, every year I uh, have what is called a, a win a trip contest where I take a student with me uh, on a reporting trip, uh, typically to Africa, but occasionally it's been to Asia or somewhere else. And um, so um, uh, I always get people asking, hey, you know, can I join your trip? Um, what they don't know is that Within the New York Times, uh, the joke is that first prize is a trip with me. Uh, second prize is two trips with me. But um, that's because it's an entirely different kind of travel. Um, I think um, I have the um, uh, record for the you know cheapest night at a hotel ever, about 50 cents in, in Chad, um, and barely worth that. But fortunately, I'm not in charge of accommodations on this trip, and it, uh, I think this is going to be a... Um, uh, uh, a really splendid and important trip. Uh, I was eager to sign on partly because of the places we'll be going to. Um, I'll, uh, I've never been to Easter Island. Uh, it's hard to get to. Um, and uh, although I spent a lot of time in the South Pacific, I never managed to get to uh, Samoa. And um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to um, those two places. It kind of hard to put together an itinerary uh, between Easter Island and, and Samoa. Um, I'd uh, welcome your questions, but let me just also talk a little bit about some of the topics that, you know, I'd like to, uh, talk about, uh, on the uh, trip and, you know, I'm certainly eager to make it a conversation with people, but, um, uh, you know, one of the things I look forward to talking about is just the degree to which the ways in which journalism has been transformed. Uh, in the more than 30 years that I've been at the New York Times. Uh, when I was a foreign correspondent in China, uh, covering Tiananmen, for example, I filed by telex. And I tell young people that they don't have any idea what a telex is. Um, and uh, yet uh, still some of the basics of the craft, investigations, trying to get people to talk, uh, uh, you know, those are about the same today as they probably were in the, in the time of Homer. Um, but there, you know, it's no secret that, uh, journalism is facing something of a crisis in its business model, whether it's TV or newspapers or news magazines, and, um, they're leading us to, to try new things and, uh, uh developing new business models. Um, and, uh, that's something also that, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to talk about. I've had a long interest in philanthropy. And so one of the issues I want to talk about is that to me, one of the big changes is that we used to give or try to make a difference essentially by gut. We would had a sense of what might work. We'd write a check at the end of the year and, and kind of hope for the best. And these days there's much there, there you, you have randomized control trials to give you a sense of what works at what price. Um, and a lot of, we get a lot of surprises. For example, a turn, I, I'm a great believer in education, especially educating girls around the world in terms of giving you leverage, change societies. And it turns out the most cost effective way to get more girls in school in poor countries, you know, isn't to build more schools, things like that. It's, to deworm kids, and we don't think about that because our kids don't have intestinal parasites, and much of the world they do. Uh, you can um, deworm a child one pill of albendazole costs a few pennies, and uh, that child is much less likely to be anemic, much less likely to be sick, much less likely to miss school. And um, so, and, and there are many, many other examples like that that give us a, a much greater rigor in a sense of how to make a difference. Sort of related to that is a sense of where um, the business sector comes in. I'm a great believer that, um, you know, we tend to think of aid organizations as the groups that are changing the world. And many do a terrific job. Some don't. Um, but, you know, corporations, uh, if they address some of these issues, 
they have a scale and an impact that dwarfs anything that can happen in the nonprofit uh, sector. So I'm a, a great believer in uh, challenging corporations to improve not just corporate social responsibility, but really their basic business models to try to look at sourcing at employment practices. And uh, I think that that not only helps change the world, but also helps those individual companies because you look at millennials, they want to work for companies with values. Recruitment and retention is really important. So I think there is a, you know, a, uh, a great value there. And I look forward to chatting about that. And, and I guess I also want to talk about some of the places that we'll be visiting. Um, I, you know, reported, uh, um, from Columbia, from Australia, uh, and, um, I'll, be reporting on this trip to some degree from Easter Island and uh, Samoa, for example, you know, in Easter Island, uh, there's a fascinating issue that relates to the discussion today about climate change. Um, and as you may know, Easter Island had a very sophisticated civilization that led to these uh, huge uh, stones being brought in. Uh, and the peak of the civilization seemed to be between you know, about 1000 and about uh, 1400 uh, AD. And then by the time Westerners arrived in Israel, the civilization had collapsed. And there are all kinds of theories about what went wrong. But one of the leading theories is that it was essentially environmental mismanagement and deforestation. And a society that was incredibly sophisticated collapsed very, very quickly because they were not prudent about managing environmental uh, risks. Uh, so I'll talk about that, about lessons to be learned from Easter Island as we examine uh, those great stone monoliths. And um, so I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to this. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, fire away and hope to see you on the plane. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nick, for that one. Um, I should say, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you can submit those now. There's a box in the right-hand side of, uh, of the control panel there. Um, so I'm just gonna take a look and see if any have come through. And while I do that, I had one question um, for you, and that was around, um, I guess, your sanity. Like you're covering such such serious topics. How do you stay sane and not become, like if, if it was me, I think I'd become a bit of an emotional wreck. How do you sort of try and keep the perspective and give yourself, but not, I guess, too much? You know, people always ask that, and they always ask it in this very delicate way, as if they think I'm about to crumble. Uh, <laughs> and but the truth is that I'm—I mean, I'm actually a fairly optimistic um, person, and I managed to come back from some of these trips, you know, strangely feeling almost better about humanity. Uh, I remember one trip to Congo, which is the scene of the most lethal conflict since World War II, um, arguably the rape capital of the world. And I interviewed a warlord who was busy slaughtering people, massacring people, and he underscored the human capacity for evil. But on that same trip, I interviewed, uh, you know, some some people fighting against him, in particular this incredible Polish nun who'd been in Congo for 30 years and she was running an emergency feeding center and she was uh, running a school and she was negotiating to get the warlord out of her town when all other aid workers had fled. And she kind of underscored the human capacity for courage, for good, for resilience, for altruism, for compassion. And when people in these places I mean, these people are tested in a way that we aren't. And when people are tested, it's incredible how wonderful they can be. And so I managed to come back from Eastern Congo kind of feeling better about the about human nature, uh, astonishingly enough. Um, and so I'm, you know, my, my trips have, have ta taught me that evil is a real thing. It sounds like this sort of Old Testament word. Evil is, you know, you... You see warlords who are genuinely evil, but you also see uh, the absolute best of humanity and typically side by side with the worst of humanity, you see the best. Thank you. I think that's nice to end on, a, on an upbeat note there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so another question would be, you have an annual writing competition. Um, you've just announced your, your competition was 2017. How much does 
that younger generation inspire you and do you get ideas for articles and sort of new areas to investigate as a result of the submissions that you read? You know, if you're, um, if you're middle-aged, you know, for the last 2,000 years, it's kind of been, you're supposed to sort of roll your eyes and hear her about how awful young people are. And in fact, I'm really kind of encouraged. I think that uh, millennials and, and post-millennials um, really care about the world. Um, I think I'm kind of, I came at the tail end of the baby boomers, and I think uh, boomers had some idealism but often weren't very practical about how to bring about change and often focused on symbolic changes that didn't really make much difference at the ground. And I think that young people today marry an idealism about wanting to make a difference with a practical sense of what actually works. And so I, I admire that. I am inspired by it. Um, and I'd say that one of the advantages of these uh, this win a trip journey that I take with a winning student is that you know in journalism we tend to write about things that change what's new but some of the most important things going on in the world are happening every day they're the same and um, so the so malnutrition child mortality maternal mortality uh, and so that that trip becomes a way for me to address these issues in my column, partly in the guise of showing a student these issues, then it becomes a vehicle to try to, to, to engage with readers on these issues, uh, both in my column and in, and in videos. Mm -hmm. okay. And revisiting those that maybe people have forgotten and looking at in a different light as well. Yeah, I mean, the you know, you can make a case that um, Every day, there should be a front page story saying um, 16,000 kids died yesterday unnecessarily uh, of diarrhea, disease, malnutrition. Um, you can also make a case that the headline in the front page should be um, every day should be 200,000 people moved out of extreme poverty yesterday. Um, I mean, there. <laughs> this is a time there are about 5.9 million kids who die every year unnecessarily. Um, but there's also been a stunning decline in, in child mortality. It's dropped by more than half, uh, since 1990, a stunning decline in, um, uh, in extreme poverty. Um, you know, our generation will lick extreme poverty on our watch. Uh, uh there'll still be a lot of poor people, mm -hmm. but the very worst kind of poverty, illiteracy, it, uh, you know, when I was born, a majority of humans had always been illiterate. Um, since the mid-1960s, a majority of adults have been literate. And now uh, about 90% uh, are illiterate. And when people are illiterate, that has a huge impact on social behaviors, on their economic possibilities. So, um, see, I'm, it's pretty hard to shake my optimism. <laughs> Love it. And so if people want to uh, see you live again, you obviously hold regular Facebook live sessions. Do you know when your next one is? Actually, my next, I just was planning it. My next one uh, will be at uh, two o'clock uh, in New York time uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, if you just go to my Facebook page, um, uh, facebook.com um, slash Christoph, then um, see you at two. Yeah, so there you go. You can finish <laughs> up with this, go and grab your lunch um, and then dial back in and, and see Nick. So thank you very much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. And with that, we're going to let Nick go so that he can go and plan for his <laughs> Facebook Live uh, this afternoon. But we're delighted that he was able to, to join us here for this. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Lisa Lesperon. So Lisa is a program manager at uh, Abercrombie in Kent. She works in their private jet and uh, special interest travel department. She has years and years of planning, uh, planning tours and immersive experiences around the world. So with this, I'm going to hand over controls with the modern, wonders of modern day technology. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about, uh, we heard about why New York Times, and now I want to tell you about the other half of the partnership, YNK, and why this is such the perfect uh, 
the perfect melding of um, two two companies that are really dedicated to providing the most immersive experience uh, to our guests. So. Abercrombie & Kent has been the world's premier luxury tour travel company for more than 50 years. Our roots actually go back all the way to 1962 when Jeffrey Kent, who you can see here, um, he pioneered luxury safari experiences in his native Kenya. ANK's approach to travel combines impeccable service with immersive, authentic insider access opportunities unlike anything you've experienced before. So let's jump into the private jet experience. And as you can see, uh, that's our beautiful 757 jet, which is what we travel the world with. And your private jet experience, it really starts with the very best tour directors and local guides on the planet. ANK's private jet tour staff is the best in the world. We handpick them from around the world as a global team, and they're specially trained for private jet journeys. Leading the team will be your tour director who keeps everything running smoothly throughout the journey, along with his team of experienced tour managers. So the tour managers are each, each responsible for smaller groups of 16 guests within the larger group. You also have a dedicated luggage manager who takes care of your luggage from start to finish. You never have to worry about getting your luggage from place to place. And then in addition to the tour staff that actually travels along with you for the entirety of the trip, you also have the benefit of additional insight from our local experts that we meet along the way in each destination. Those local experts are key to bringing to life the history, the stories, and the culture of each destination that we visit from um, a real a first-hand insider's perspective. ANK also has a global presence. So we have more than 50 local offices located throughout the world. And what that means is that we have connections and access that are really unmatched throughout the tour industry. And what that gives us is the ability to offer you, the guest, um, access to people and sites far away from the crowds and really beyond the reach of the average traveler, not what the average tourist would be able to do in destination. So how we travel around. So beyond the exceptional experience that you'll have on the ground, it's also important to understand the luxury you'll experience in the sky as you travel. Maybe one of the most valuable aspects of traveling around the world by private jet is the convenience. So we're able to land in exotic destinations that are not easily accessible by commercial flights. We can expedite long custom, customs procedures, and we really set our own timetable so we're not beholden to any of the airports and um, runway schedules, anything like that. Um, if you try to replicate this itinerary with scheduled commercial air, you'd really face a logistical nightmare of connections and forced overnights, really long layovers. Um, all of that goes away. It's all solved by the access and the ease of traveling on a private jet. So as for the plane itself, our chartered Boeing 757 jet, it's specially reconfigured to feature all fully lie flat handmade leather seats with massage functions, power ports at your fingertips, and every, every detail of the in-flight experience is engineered for your comfort. We've got Bose headphones at every seat. We've got iPads loaded with movies and music. We have custom-made mattress pads and duvet covers. It's the whole nine yards. And thanks to our talented onboard executive chef, every meal is an elegant dining experience complete with a premium selection of spirits and a very well-chosen wine list. But probably most important of all uh, with your experience inside the jet is our wonderful hand-picked flight crew. And they travel with you from start to finish, same crew. And they really work tirelessly to create a comfortable, sort of a home away from home for you aboard the jet. So, you know, as you're going from place to place, 26 days is a long time to travel, but you feel like you always have a home to go back to every time you get back on the plane and sort of see your family, the crew members. So from there, let's jump into an overview of the Cultures and Transformation itinerary. So this is a 26-day journey around the world. Our dates are February 8th through March 5th, 2018, and we have a maximum capacity of 50 guests with a price point of $135,000 per person. We start the journey in New York City, and from there we fly south and west to get around the world, starting in Havana, Cuba. From there we go to Bogota, Colombia. Easter Island, Chile, Appia, Samoa, Sydney, Australia, 
Yangon, Myanmar, Isfahan, Iran, Marrakesh and Erika Diaz, Morocco, Reykjavik, Iceland, and then we finish back in New York City. So we, be we begin our journey in New York City, and upon arrival in New York, we're going to spend one night at the Four Seasons Hotel, and we'll kick off our, our event that evening with a private cocktail reception and dinner so you can meet your fellow travelers and tour staff. And then the next morning, we have exclusive access at the New York Times building. This is something that is really special and is really something you can only, you can only get if you're on this tour with us. And at the New York Times building, we'll have a privately guided tour of the office, um, including the famed newsroom. And then we'll have a private brunch with Arthur Sulzberger, Jr., the chairman and publisher of the Times. Following brunch, we'll get back on our private jet and set off for Havana. And joining us for our time in Havana and Bogota is Alan Riding, who uh, Victoria mentioned earlier on in the presentation. So he'll be along the way to add some colorful context from his decades of experience living and working in Latin America. In Havana, we have a three-night stay at the historic Saratoga Hotel. And Havana offers us a wealth of opportunities to dive deep into the past and the present of U.S.-Cuba relations uh, with Alan as well as with a local Times expert. Some of the highlights of our experience in Havana are a private Buena Vista Social Club style concert with an opportunity to interact with the musicians. We'll go behind the scenes of a local artist studio. We'll visit a cigar factory and learn about the lives of the workers there. We'll take a private salsa dancing lesson. We'll explore the architecture of the city and we'll even play baseball with some of the locals. From Havana, we head south to Bogota, Colombia, where we have a three-night stay at the JW Marriott Bogota Hotel. And some of the highlights of our time in Cartagena include a private dinner outdoors overlooking the sea, complete with live music, a folkloric dance performance, and even a private street market set up just for us. We'll also have a privately guided visit to the Botero Museum and a discussion on emerging Colombian artists in Bogota's art di district. We'll meet with a local journalist for cultural and political context and experience a private dinner event in the famous Salt Cathedral with a traditional dance and music performance. We'll also have a design your day opportunity. So this is a day where we give you a bunch of different options and you pick the one that you're most excited about. So some of the options you'll have to choose from are a cultural culture excursion uh, to one of the local visits, uh, to one of the local markets with a local expert, a tour of Simone Bolivar's former home, um, or even a Colombian music lecture followed by dance lessons. From Bogota, we fly on to Easter Island, where we have a three-night stay at the Explora Rafa Nui Hotel. Um, as you heard earlier, we'll be joined by Nick Kristoff for this leg of our journey, as well as our next stops in Samoa and Australia. On Easter Island, we'll discover the famous Moai statues during a privately guided hike. We'll enjoy a sunset cocktail on top of Rana Kau, a dormant volcano. And we'll be treated to a traditional dance performance after a private lunch on the beach. We'll also visit Orongo Ceremonial Village and experience the magic of ancient rituals. We'll have some options to try Polynesian rowing. We'll visit a local music school and discover some historic cave paintings. From Easter Island, we're continuing on to the island of Samoa. And here we have a very brief one-night stay at the Sheraton Aggies Gray Resort. And here we'll be treated to a colorful local dance performance and a little bit of R&R &R on the beach to take a break from in sort of the middle point of our trip. From Samoa, we're carrying on to Sydney. And in Sydney, we have a three-night stay at the Park Hyatt Sydney, which overlooks the world-famous Sydney Opera House. And one of the big highlights of our time in Sydney is a harbor cruise on a privately chartered, chartered yacht. And during this cruise, we'll make multiple stops for immersive culinary experiences, from wine tasting with the sommelier to tastings at hidden gems only locals know about, to a pop-up restaurant and chef interaction exclusively for us. Another Another experience highlight of Sydney is a private helicopter flight over the Greater Blue Mountains. And 
this helicopter flight is taking us out into the bush, so we'll have sort of a traditional Aussie experience in the bush with horseback riding, options to ride a uh, four by four into the bush to see kangaroos and wallabies. It's really an unforgettable experience. Okay, from Sydney, we're carrying on to Myanmar, where we have a two-night stay at the Belmont Governor's Residence. And joining us for our travels in Myanmar, Iran, and Morocco is Elaine Cialino, and she'll lend her vast first-hand knowledge and expertise to our experience uh, as we travel through these destinations. Among some of the highlights of our time in Yangon is a private cocktail party with Masa Nagy, who's a former personal assistant to a current government leader who has a lot of really rich stories to share with us. We'll have a chance to participate in a traditional blessing ceremony at the Reclining Buddha Pagoda. We'll be able to light oil lamps at sunset at the sacred Shwedagon Pagoda and enjoy our beautiful hotel. From Yangon, we're going to move on to Isfahan, Iran for a three-night stay at the historic Abbasi Hotel. And Iran really gives us a chance to delve deep into one of, uh, one of the world's oldest civilizations. During our visit, we'll explore the Armenian Quarter and the fascinating uh, Maiden Square. We'll experience the energy of the bustling bazaars filled with arts and handicrafts. And we'll also get a chance to visit the stunning Friday Mosque. We'll also visit the Palace of Forty Columns, very famous palace along the way, before heading on to Morocco. So from Iran, we continue our journey in Morocco, where we have a one-night stay in A&K's exclusive luxury desert camp, followed by two nights in Marrakesh at the Four Seasons. And joining us in Morocco and continuing on to Iceland is Elizabeth Miller. So she'll be there to lend insight and context to our time there, as well as that we will be meeting some local journalists as well while we're in Morocco. Some of the highlights of our experience in Morocco include a camel ride to the dunes for our exclusive desert camp experience for an overnight in the Sahara. In Marrakesh, we'll have a private demonstration of Arabian horsemanship. We'll meet a local Times expert to learn more about conflicts in northern Africa. We'll explore the, the maze of stalls in the, in the souk. We'll enjoy a carriage ride around the famed Marjorelle Garden, and then we'll also have an exclusive night of entertainment at a, tr at a traditional Berber feast. From Morocco, we head to our final stop, which is in Reykjavik, Iceland, where we have a three-night stay at the Hotel Borg. So while we're in Reykjavik, some of the highlights include a day trip to Singveller National Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's also where the Vikings established the very first parliament in 630 AD. We'll also have a chance to see Stroker Geyser erupt. We'll visit a working, a working farm to see Icelandic horses and have a private lunch in their greenhouse. We'll also have an after-hours visit to Blue Lagoon, which is a really special experience away from the crowd. And then to cap it all off, we'll also visit Europe's second largest, largest glacier for a champagne toast inside an ice tunnel. We'll have a private opening at the National Museum of Iceland. And then we will head back to New York City to wrap up the trip. So that is our 26-day itinerary traveling all around the world. And from there, we can jump into some frequently asked questions. So I'll just run through these really quick. Um, and you will also have a chance to ask your own questions. But um, some of the frequently asked questions that we get are, how challenging is the activity level of this trip? So um, it's, really, it's really scalable for every guest. We don't have anything so strenuous that you wouldn't be able to participate if you didn't want to. And also our tour staff is really great about working with you on the ground to make sure that you're comfortable with everything that we're doing and to set up the next day's activities, excursions, to make sure that you know what to expect and to make the right choices for you. So as far as strenuous activity level goes, it's very scalable and it's um, definitely something that we can work with you on and nothing to worry too much about. As far as seating on the jet, when you book, you actually have the chance to choose your own seats and those are your seats for the entirety of the trip. All meals are included throughout the 26 days, so that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For breakfast, you always have the option of having room service if you don't want to come down to the restaurant. 
Uh, wine and beer is included in every single lunch and dinner throughout. And of course, bottled water is provided on excursions. And anytime we're traveling, you also have that included as well. There are visas required to travel to some of the destinations included on this itinerary. And we really help you with that process. We give you all the documentation you need for um, applying for your visas. We can kind of hold your hand throughout the process and make sure you have everything you need and also provide some resources. If you want to get some help with a visa service, we can point you in the right direction. So we can definitely help you out on that end. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate you walking through um, through the itinerary like that. I mean, really, where do you start in, in producing um, an itinerary that's so special and so unique? And I know that we spent a lot of back and a lot of time going back and forth between the New York Times and and the team at Abercrombie and Kent to create something that was really very special and sort of touched upon the New York Times strengths, both in terms of our columns and our articles, but also the destinations that really resonate. And I think it's ended up being something really very special indeed. Um, so I know uh, you obviously just covered off a load of the. Um, FAQ type questions. Um, so I'm just going to see if there have been uh, any questions submitted. Um, so I think there must have been a problem with uh, my cursor. So somebody had asked, is it possible to move the cursor? Well, hopefully that I, I was able to do that and, and that helped. Um, somebody, <laughs> somebody else asking, is this the A and K jet? Yes, it is the same jet that we use for our A and K branded tours. This is the same exact jet. Great. Um, somebody else saying, is there a promotion for early booking? We don't have any promotions currently for early booking, but I would definitely encourage you to call in and talk to um, either your own travel professional or call us directly and um, let us know what you're thinking and we can give you some more information. Thank you. Um, now they're coming in thick and fast, so let's go to the next one. Um, oh, so somebody's asking, is it possible to receive a copy of the FAQ and the full webinar slideshow? Yes, definitely. So we're going to be uh, sending this over to everybody who registered later, um, well, probably tomorrow by the time we've just edited it and, and tidied it up a little bit. But in the meantime, there is also um, a copy of the catalogue that we produced as one of the handouts here. So if you do want to get some, some more information right away, you can have a look at that. And also uh, by looking at either the Times Journeys website, timesjourneys.com, or going and looking at the Abercrombie and Kent website too. Uh, next question. Um, is there unscheduled time at each destination? Yes, definitely. So what we try to do is really build in a good balance of scheduled programming and also some downtime in between. And then the other thing is that, of course, every every activity is optional. So. If there's one day, we know 26 days, it's a long time to be on the road, even uh, when you're traveling in this way, kind of um, in the most easy way possible. But, um, you know, there are days where eh, you just feel like enjoying the resort for the day and maybe you want to skip out on some things. That's totally fine as well. But um, we definitely do make sure to build in some downtime as well into the itinerary. Thank you. Uh... Is there a brochure specific to this trip? How do we get one? Well, I, I, hopefully I just answered that one. So there should be one in your handout here. Um, but if you um, want a hard copy, then please send us your information and we can get one mailed out to you. Uh, the Times Journeys website is timesjourneys.com, which was the other question. Um, and then uh, I think this is a question from uh, from an agent asking, can you provide a short video giving the info we heard so we can forward to our clients to help promote the trip? We'll, we'll be uh, sharing the webinar with everybody. So hopefully that will be uh, something that you can share with your clients um, at a time and they can then watch that at whatever time suits them. Uh, that's all of the questions for now. Oh, hang on. One more question. 
Uh, so this question, um, how, I mean, this is the very first private jet initiative we've done. So we're, we're very excited to be partnering with uh, with Abercrombie and Kent to, to help us with this one. Um, and the questions come in, how soon do you foresee the jet being full? How quickly do we need to book? Um, from my standpoint, we only have one departure. We have 50 places on the on the tour. Um, a lot of you might have seen there was um, uh, an ad that ran in the New York Times today to promote this trip. And um, because of that, we just don't know how quickly it's going to sell out. So if there is interest, then I would just say get in touch uh, right now and, and sign up because there really is um, a very limited space. I don't know, Lisa, if you want to add anything else to that question. No, I totally agree with you. You know, because this is such a unique partnership and such a, a really interesting itinerary with that added layer of the New York Times experts to it, um, I do think that if you're wanting to join this trip, uh, definitely get in touch with your, your travel professional or call us and um, definitely register your interest because I do think it'll, it'll go pretty fast. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and we've had one other question, somebody asking about security. Okay, so just general general security or a specific destination? The, literally the question was, what about security? Okay, so just, well, um, <laughs> I can tell you that as far as in the airports that we, we fly in and out of, uh, typically we have expedited security processes where um, you know we don't have to wait in many lines all of your paperwork is filled out as far as arrival cards departure cards all of that's taken care of for you so as far as within airports the security um, of course we always have to comply with the airport security procedures but we do um, oftentimes get expedited access through those security procedures as far as security and the destinations we travel to um, of course we have um, this is kind of where it comes in handy that we have so many local offices throughout the world. We have really strong partnerships with trusted local partners on the ground in every destination we travel to. And uh, those local partners help us ensure that we have the most safe and also, uh, you know, immersive, authentic experience possible. But safety, of course, is always our first priority. So we take great pains to make sure that um, that's always something that's taken care of and very carefully considered when we're selecting destinations. Thank you. Yeah. And, and from a New York Times standpoint as well, we wouldn't be running trips to destinations that we didn't think were safe. Um, it's, it's, I'm sure you can appreciate when you put the New York Times name on something, it lends itself a level of trust, which is so important to us. And if we felt for any second, any reason at all that there was a problem in a destination, we wouldn't be offering it. And obviously, um, working with the experts like Abercrombie and Kent, it allows us to um, very closely monitor any ongoing situations that may arise um, and to take um, according action. Um, oh, and then finally, because I think this is going to be the last question. Um, Need more information regarding flight accommodation and what will be the maximum travel time in the air? So I guess, Lisa, maybe if you can talk to you very quickly again, just summarizing some of the, the flight times, as in the distances, the amount of time in the air um, and uh, the, the plane itself. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our flight times range for this itinerary from as little uh, as one and a half hours all the way up to 11 and a half hours. But um, like I said, the private jet, it's uh, quite the comfortable experience. Every seat is completely lie flat, and we have a lot of goodies that help you get comfortable on the plane, um, along with some pretty spectacular meals as well, along with entertainment. So I would say that even on the long flights, uh, we actually sometimes have people say that they wish there were more long flights because it's so comfortable on the jet that it's actually almost a pleasure to be on it for so many hours. So, um, so that kind of gives you an idea. If you look in the brochure or on this uh, PowerPoint presentation, you'll see on the map for each destination, we have the actual flight times listed out for each segment. So uh, that's a helpful resource as well to kind of see exact flight times for every segment. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, now we've got some other questions that have been submitted, but unfortunately we're going to have to wrap it up there. So what I'll do is I'll make sure that they all get passed over to Lisa so that she can either answer them personally or hand them over to the most appropriate person on the uh, Abercrombie and Kent team. Um, but all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you do have any questions, then uh, please do call um, either your travel professional or uh, Abercrombie and Kent at 844-761-6999 and they'll be more than happy to, to answer any questions or to take uh, to take your booking. Uh, Lisa, any parting words for you? I just wanted to say thank you so much for hosting and for joining in this webinar. We hope you are excited about the itinerary as much as we are and we hope to see you on board the jet. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lisa. I couldn't agree more. We'll see you all very soon, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.